I'm so glad um, that those of you who are able to join us for the live WebEx um, are here today. It's been a really good week in the discussion forums, um, and we'll get right to your questions in a minute. Um, why don't we start as we usually do? We'll have our panelists that are in the studio do a quick introduction, and then we'll go um, to our remote panelists. So, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, Dave Neundorfer, CEO of Linestream Technologies, uh, based here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we spun out of one of the anchor institutions here, uh, Cleveland State University, about six years ago. Uh, we are an embedded software company. Uh, we embed our software onto semiconductors and help with the uh, performance of automated products. Uh, I'm Joe Jankowski. I am the Chief Innovation Officer for Case Western Reserve University. And uh, in that capacity, I've um, worked uh, tech transfer for about a decade, uh, spinning off companies as well as, as licensing engagements in the Cleveland area with uh, three of the anchor institutions, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve University, and University Hospitals, which is our primary affiliate. Uh, and then in, the, in that capacity, I've also worked um, on the other side of the street, if you will, with uh, probably about a half dozen venture-backed companies in which I've served as a board member, um, typically in the, in the medical device space, but but running uh, running most of the, the tech areas to date. Great. And I'm not 100% sure if our remote panelists are on, but let's give it a shot. Um, Alexis, are you with us? He's trying a new microphone, so we'll let you know when he's okay. all ready. And how about Leonce, Suzanne? No. OK. Not, not, yeah, not available yet. OK. Uh, so Leonce from Cote d'Ivoire and Alexis from Greece will hopefully be joining us shortly. But um, we'll work with one of the nice things about doing having in studio is that we have uh, folks here. Um, and love look forward, those of you who are on um, the WebEx, please um, let Suzanne know your questions. You can text them in. Um, you can do it via audio or do it via video. So we will get right to it. So let's start with a question from um, that came in through the discussion forum. Um, Boss von Hutterd from Netherlands, who's actually done a wonderful job with a lot of her posts, um, she asked a question, and I'll, and I'll pose it to both um, Dave and Joe here, about why publicly, funded, why publicly funded anchor institutions can license research when the funding was done by the public. Shouldn't the research be owned by the public? Um, so, I mean, Dave, you've taken a, a, a technology that was paid for by public money mm -hmm. and turn it into a company. How mm -hmm. would you respond to sort of boss, I mean, you know, this is a for-profit company and you have investors that are looking to make money on this, uh, on this opportunity? Absolutely, so it's a, it's a great question and um, the way I would answer it is uh, when the for-profit company succeeds um, and eventually has a liquidity event, um, our uh, university, uh, the public university that uh, we spun out from uh, will participate in that uh, in that event. So, um, Cleveland State University has a uh, portion of equity uh, in our company, Linestream Technologies. Uh, so we're very much both aligned, public and private, to go out uh, and try to uh, have the biggest uh, liquidity event uh, possible. And the investors, the team, as well as the university and uh, the inventors and founders would would benefit from that. That's so. great. Yeah, this is fun. This is the teaching moment of, because uh, I've been asked this question, you know, and, and society's asked this question for, you know, at least 32 years, because in the United States in 1980, Baidol changed the game. Prior to, the public did own it. And of course, when the public owns something, um, you can say, well, it's either in the public art and no one has rights, right? So that would literally be we just have published it and there's no, there's no asset per se. Or someone owns a patent, right? And then you say, well, who owns that asset? The public can't be the assignee on a patent. So up until 1980, the federal government owned the patent on behalf of the public. Um, Practically, for those of you out there who have seen the uh, last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they put the Ark into a giant warehouse of assets that the U.S. Army holds and it's never seen again, that's what happened. There would be a patent sitting there, and with the federal government, you know, not to pick on the government, but you know, bureaucracies are not as effective as, as capital groups, so it would just sit there. So in 1980, they said, let's put it in the hands of the institutions. Let's let Cleveland State own it. Let's let you know Stanford own it. 
They have obligations to the public. They have to make it available for federal use. They actually have an obligation to invest in it and to try to put it out in the public through a company. Um, when they do, they can receive finances for it. And those finances, it's written in the law, should be used to propagate the um, the public good mission of the institution to continue scholarship research and training. Um, so the reality again is if you quickly said you'd say practically someone has to own it. You can't just say the patent's out there because otherwise the patent's worthless so everyone has access to it. And then who should own it? Let's let the institutions own it but with the obligation to invest in taking it forward for best use which again usually will be through a commercial partner. Great. Thanks Joe and Dave. And we have a question from the chat room. Suzanne? Um, actually, I wanted to let you know that Alexis is should now be on and available for you. Okay, great. Hey, Alexis, if you can just quickly uh, introduce yourself, that'd be great. He's humble. Suzanne, are we able to hear Alexis? Yep. Or hi, Alexis. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the crowd? Okay. We can barely hear you, Alexis. Okay. So, so we okay. will uh, we'll hold off on that we'll hold off on that introduction. Um, and do we have a question from the chat room, or should I take one of the ones that I have right here, Suzanne? Go ahead and take one of the ones you have right okay, there. Okay, great. Let me actually on the theme. And Alexis is joining us from Athens. We actually have a good question that came from Greece from Natasha Apostolidi. Um, she said that much of the research conducted at university never makes it off the shelf but nonetheless might be commercially valuable. And would like the panel to talk more about how institutions like universities might find new ways to get such research off the shelf and into practice. So maybe I'll have you both address it. I mean, I think Dave Linestream was a good example of a technology that was on the shelf for quite a long time yep. before it got commercialized. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, Linestream, so a little bit of background. Uh, Linestream was born out of the research of a professor at uh, CSU, Dr. Jurjun Gao, who had really been incubating and, and, and germinating this idea, this concept, uh, for about 10 years. Um, and the last four of those, um, he and a few of his former and existing students uh, tried to uh, begin the commercialization uh, process. So uh, Linestream is certainly one of those success stories where you know, the core technology did find its way out of a uh, research center at a university. Uh, and we are commercializing it as we speak. Uh, we're, we're selling our software uh, globally on the um, semiconductors provided by Texas Instruments. Um, but that said, I think uh, you know, Cleveland State and the Fenn School of Engineering has been around for a while, and that was the first time that there was a spin out of a core technology from CSU. Um, so I think you're, you're absolutely right that uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of research um, in these universities that, um, that may not ever get spun out. And I think that Joe can probably speak to uh, some of the initiatives that are in place to try to get, you know, at least provide a channel for it, uh, seeing the light of day. Yeah, it, it's the most difficult um, thing to impact. And it's also the most important thing to aspire to, right? At the end of the day, we want these technologies to find homes, again, in the public good, usually through a, a commercial partner. Um, and you say, well, why do they sit there on shelves? Um, one is to set uh, you know, sort of context is they also sit on shelves in corporations, even groups that are very good at taking things to market. You know, the general scholars will say about 85 to 90 percent of patents go unused. And, you know, General Electric and, and Dow Corning and groups, giant corporations, sit there with intellectual assets that are not being practiced. So at the university level, you say, well, you know, how do we improve? Um, I think the way to improve is to embrace entrepreneurship. Um, usually, again, there are, there are exceptions. It, it there are about 20 exceptions a year to the fact that our technology is too early, right? So we receive 200 inventions, 20 will find homes with corporations. The other 180, you could argue, are sitting there. Um, the way to get those out is if we say, well, the large corporations don't want these typically because they're too early or they don't align with the um, infrastructure resources that that corporation currently has dedicated to such a product. Um, then you say, well, what can we do to find the Daves of the world, to find someone who can create a vehicle for this technology? And so, you know, 
the person who's going to take it off the shelf or the entity who's going to take it off the shelf is going to be that that enterprise that that new newly formed enterprise and i think that entrepreneurship in the last 10 years has proven out that you know they're the most effective that privately held you know small fast growing companies are really the best way to add value to early stage assets that were created through research rather than hoping that one of the multi global conglomerates um, finds that this fits the specific need they have. So embracing entrepreneurship and training our students and our talent in the region to look for those opportunities and to have relationships with the anchor institutions is probably the most general but best way to, to help to get more things off of the shelf. Great. Thanks, Joe and Dave. Um, and Suzanne, are we, how are we doing with Leonce and, and Alexis? Are they there now? Alexis, we're still trying to troubleshoot his audio issues. Leonce is here, and you should be able to chat with him now. Great. Hey, Leonce, thanks for joining. Thanks, everybody. Great. Can you just quickly introduce yourself? So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a lecturer in the business school in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm a um, communication engineer at um, project manager for a couple of infrastructure development in the telecom industry. And uh, after that, I did it in Barcelona at ABC Business School, and I've chosen to, 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 to go to the academic path. So I'm at the Agricos, my, my home field, and in technology in a business school in which we've talked and many activities in the country. Great. Thanks, Leon. And it may be, and Suzanne maybe can work with you, it might make more sense just because of bandwidth issues if maybe you go to audio. Um, but let me ask a question um, back to you about, we had a good question from the chat room from um, Ed, Edita Bednarova from Slovakia. And she wants to know what ways that universities are trying to support their students' entrepreneurial ambitions whether it be a training, networking, or even workspace? Are there examples of innovative, effective forms of support? So what's, what's happening at your university in terms of supporting student-led entrepreneurship? So the university is that we having programs with uh, executives, so they're having own companies, and uh, basically, what we're trying to do is to give them all the management capabilities so that they could have very competitive business. And um, by, by doing that, also, we have a very strong focus on entrepreneurship uh, activities. So what they do is basically trying to benchmark the business um, kind of globally and trying to know what the best has been uh, done in these countries and trying to replicate them here. So this is basically at the level of executive education programs. Apart from that, we, the people that have been graduated in our program, we have uh, set we have set up a, an angel network. So this initiative has been done so that, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, it's great. I think it's better, yeah, the audio is great. Just stay, stay on audio. So we've set up a, a, a business angel network with them so that they can also, by themselves, support the growth of young entrepreneurs. So it's, something, it's been something very new in this country because the angel investing activity was, you know, uh, almost nobody was doing that in this country. And uh, it's been kind of trying to give them the support so that they could identify very interesting project. And since they kind of, uh, I would say, uh, kind of upper class, you know, um, people in this country, so that they could also, from their own pocket, finance and fund some of the some of the entrepreneurial projects that are here in this country. This is something we're trying to do as uh, an academic institution to support the growth of entrepreneurship in Africa. Great. 
And Joe, I don't know if you want to chime in. I mean, a lot has changed during since when you started at Case sure. Western to now in terms of the support of student-led entrepreneurship. Yeah, and I respectfully say that 12 years ago at Case Western Reserve University, um, the only student uh, programs for entrepreneurship were if you actually were enrolled, you know, you were a tuition-paying student in such a program. Today, you know, roughly a decade later, we, we've preserved or still have several um, in-classroom sorts of uh, uh, groups for, for students who really want to focus on entrepreneurship. But where I think the most growth and the most impact has been that all students, regardless of you know, what their major is, whether they're in physics or you know, the arts, um, have access to capabilities such as um, laboratories. Uh, a lot of times we'll call them you know, sandboxes in which collaborators can come and play. They have access to professional networks of, of uh, lawyers. Um, um, you know, Michael knows we've just recently created a um, intellectual property and venture law clinic, and, and a clinic is a uh, resource run through the law school in which third-year law students provide legal services for free to young entrepreneurs, or they don't have to be young, but to entrepreneurs in, in, this, in the regional, in this, you know, particularly the university ecosystem. Um, so they teach them about why do you need a patent and how do you structure your business. Likewise, we have programs um, to allow students to see assets from the research enterprise to say here are inventions that have been made would you like to work on these as a student team or even as an individual and maybe one day take this out as the you know leader of an enterprise um, so long story short uh, we still have some formal education but the real energy and the real value is a bunch of what we would call extracurricular programs to allow students access to um, to networks to facilities and to an understanding that this is a career option for them um, and I think it's just growing I think that you'll continue to see investment in this area because I think it's what students are looking for um, we've seen in the US you know uh, MIT Duke the West Coast schools everyone is recognizing now that despite the fact that in the 1990s some of your coolest technologies came out of university laboratories, that in the 2000s and in the next couple decades, the coolest technologies or companies are not going to come out of the laboratories, but out of the student base, which is just an immense high energy you know, asset because of the talent and the flexibility that, that it brings. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, Alexis, are you, are you connected and able to hear us? All right, having some uh, bits of Michael. Yeah, hey, Alexis. Oh, great, it's working now. All right, we can hear you. Good, thanks for joining. Maybe if you could just quickly introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yes, yes. I, I'm uh, calling from Greece. I'm calling in from Greece. I'm uh, running the Entrepreneurship Center here at Alba Graduate Business School, which is a business school focusing on MBAs and MSCs. And we are trying to push up the involvement of students in creative entrepreneurship and move them away a bit from traditional career paths. So we are in the making of what uh, you have already been discussing there. Great. And let me let me pose it. Let me get you into the conversation and pose a question that comes from Alexander uh, Gordopala from Moscow. He says that in Russia. Um, academic knowledge rarely translate into, in, translates into an ability to commercialize research. Should academics strive to develop business skills? That's an interesting question. Um, it, it, it all depends uh, on, on the incentives that we have, but I think we need to stop being passive as uh, students or as academics or as administrators and start being active. Every academic has a, a specific uh, research field and a specific interest, and we need to defend and define our own. So I would say that entrepreneurial application of the academic research is up to the person and not the, the unit. Great. Um, let me pose another question to Leonce um, that came from uh, Ibrahim Said. He wants to know that whether anchor institutions should be focusing on specific sectors of the economy over others. Maybe, Leonce, you can talk about in Cote d'Ivoire um, what sectors are, from your perspective, in terms of like folk, having entrepreneurs go into, what are the sectors that you guys are focused on? Are there certain areas of strength that you're emphasizing given um, what exists in, in the Cote d'Ivoire economy? Oh, 
Okay, I'll send it to Alexis. Do you want to take that one? Yes. Um, I would say that it's a bit uh, complicated to see what an economy is doing uh, or what it's not doing, because especially in Greece now, it's, it's a turmoil and, and there are many, and many problems both on the macro and the micro environment. Uh, I would say again that it goes down to the person. Okay. And if, Joe, if I got the question right. Yeah, yeah that's great. And Joe, I mean, yeah. There's some ways that we've tried to t take advantage in the right. in the region of some strength. Maybe you can talk to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I'm on the, and not on the fence. I think that the general answer is you probably will find areas that you know we'll call the term low-hanging fruit where there is the best opportunity for you um, and I always believe that value is created at the confluence of talent opportunity and capital right if you can put resources along with talent and an opportunity that's when you create something so um, of those three pillars there may be ones that stand out so for instance in Northeast Ohio we may say we have a lot of opportunities in medicine in healthcare because of the strength of our anchor institutions um, so I think you'll play to those but you want to really play to those as the market dictates because I don't think it's I don't think universities or anchor institutions should focus and just say we're going to become the you know polymer uh, capital of the world um, rather I think you want to say where are entrepreneurs where is the the capital market and the other partners really looking at us as a source of opportunity and so I think you ultimately do um, find certain areas of that are better than others but I'm always careful not to philosophically try to determine what those are Great. Uh, and I think we have a question from the chat room. Suzanne? Yes, we have a question from Neela Dree from Cincinnati, Ohio. Thanks for putting together this WebEx. So you're welcome. Could you throw some light on the entrepreneurial activities in the micro nano electronics domain like biomedical microsystems, flexible electronics, organic LEDs, etc.? Which U.S. universities are promoting such startups among graduate students, and is there any particular field in which heavy entrepreneurial focus is being given based on the forecasts and trends by the international technology policies? Okay. <laughs> I can. Uh, Thank God I have panelists yeah. here. Uh, yeah. Joe, you want to I can start? take okay. a crack. Okay. Okay. Um, again, I, in almost following on my last answer, I don't think you want to say here's the area where it should be done or where they're best. But I do think, again, in those spaces, you're going to follow where the, you know, where the greatest research density in the in the country. So in the U.S., Albany's very strong on on nano. Um, so is the East Coast, you know, Boston areas with, with MIT. Um, uh, and I know I'll miss some. I believe uh, there's, there's another Western school that's very strong. But I think you're going to, again, you know, the part A of the answer will be the areas where you have a high or an established um, research base, you know, and you usually can track that with federal funding. Where's the NSF investing? Where are we seeing the, the best in terms of materials and, and nanomaterials? Um, the second area where you're seeing that is where they have a confluence with existing markets. So for all the sort of really cool things you can do with nano and with, you know, uh, one day the sort of what we'll say the, the 50 year out sort of Star Trek medicine, at the end of the day, you're seeing a great application for flexible polymers and for small microsystems in wearables. And in wearables, you're finding that there's a huge market in the consumer space, especially where consumer blurs with healthcare. So regions in which you have um, populations that are, are you know, adopters of, of technology. So sort of how do we integrate Fitbits or similar uh, embedded sensors or wearable sensors into existing large industries such as, you know, the U.S. healthcare system. There's another place where you'll see a lot of companies popping up, right? They may not be there because there's a high research base. They may be there because their customer base may be there. And, you know, you probably on the sensor side are, are seeing some of that along the where you, you almost the supply chain is, is going towards where the customers will be for that given product. Great, great question. Um, we had a question from Meredith Robert Robertson from North Carolina, and she went, talks about kind of this natural tension between government initiatives that are attempting to place a greater emphasis on the commercialization of government-funded research, given the natural, but there's this natural inclination to governments to avoid funding research for the purposes of making money or developing state-run companies. Um, Leonce, if, if you're able to sort of connect with us, what what are some initiatives? Is are, is the are, is the government of Cote d'Ivoire doing anything to support the commercialization of technology out of um, institutions in in um, in Cote d'Ivoire? 
our institution is not uh, it's a private institution it's, and it's not a government based institution I, I, I cannot answer this question directly but I, I know because we, we're in touch with um, one of the incubator of um, of the university of the public university it's been run for a long time so what we're trying to do is um, try to 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 sell and to see how how the different research um, the different research has been done by the professor and the result of this research they could they could be commercialized. So this this kind of been a very a very recent initiative and uh, different professors from the universities they've got uh, they went through some training to see how they could value okay the different output of the research and what are the different ways they could commercialize it either by by doing a joint venture, either it, either by licensing by licensing it, and this is something now that they know how to do, and basically they're kind of trying to, to look for different partners and see what are the different research outcomes that can that that could be valued and put uh, and commercialized. Great, thanks, Leon. So, and Alexis, I don't know if you want to comment when you look at the pipeline of um, startup companies that are, are emerging in Greece, and there's a lot um, more happening in, in startup companies. How many of the companies are sort of being spun out of, of, of institutions versus um, folks that are just sort of doing this kind of independently? Are, are you seeing a pipeline coming out of universities? Unfortunately not. Uh, it's a huge problem here. It goes back to the patent question and the ownership question. And it also goes back to the fact that most researchers uh, are happy with the European Union or the state funds for research, and they don't feel like uh, it is a necessity to go back to the market. It seems to be changing now with the European Union focusing on commercialization and with the new Horizon 2020 uh, funding projects, but we need to wait and see how this will affect the commercialization process. We do see people coming for MBAs that have an invention or a patent, but it's a very small number of people who actually want to get out of the lab and start moving forward. To be, to be clear, the most successful startups uh, in Greece are the ones that left the university with a patent, not the ones that are among friends and are based on an iPhone or a smartphone application. Yeah. It, I, I like, I agree with Alexis. I, I think I always say simply, follow the money, right? If you want to know what the government really wants to have happen here, or you want to say where our researchers going to focus their respective efforts, what are they being paid to do? And I think in the last 10 years, both in Europe and the U.S., you've seen the pendulum move more towards applied research, right, towards things that could lead to commercialization. That said, it still is largely predicated on basic research, right? So until the, the governments start to say, you know, if, if in the U.S., for instance, I believe the NIH will deploy roughly $30 billion a year into extramural research, until they start to say, we're going to fund translation and commercialization, the researchers aren't going to do that. They're going to follow the money. If the money's with basic pursuits, that's ultimately where the culture is going to lie. Um, and I don't necessarily advocate that we need to do all translation and commercialization because, of course, you say if you don't do enough basic research, there'll be nothing to apply or translate. So there needs to be a balance. But I absolutely agree that some of the, the European assessments in the UK, the REF, which the results will come out this December, that will look at the impact of science investment or university investment on society are going to probably start to become the building blocks for what's the real answer of how much of our investment as the public should go towards commercialization, how much should stick with basic science, and then likewise, where do we say here's where industry takes over, right? We, we you know, the, the original federal thing in the 1960s in the U.S. was, no, we fund basic research and we don't do commercialization, right? The commercial sector does commercialization, let them do that. I think we realize there needs to be a, a, a seamless handoff and that's where the, the funds need to be, but how much of the balance and then how does that affect the culture of researchers? we're still in a, in a transition period. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, Dave, let me ask you a question. Um, there was a question that came in from Boon Kiat Tan, and sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, um, talking about sort of student-initiated startup companies like a Facebook, a Google, a Dell that were, you know, 
Dale started in a dorm room. Zuckerberg started Facebook at um, at Harvard, and the mm -hmm. Googles as it is Stanford. You mm -hmm. graduated from Stanford Business School. You've obviously taken a different path than some of these folks. You've licensed the uh, university technology, but and maybe as you think about your classmates from Stanford, that decision to not. And, and, and students have that opportunity. They could take an idea that they developed into a technology transfer organization that has some pluses and minuses. Any thoughts on kind of, as you looked at your classmates that went the other route and sort of developed ideas that they developed at university but did not do it through the university technology transfer process? It's a good question. I, I think it comes down to whether or not you need the university's um, resources, facilities to be able to evolve, germinate, um, and eventually transfer out uh, the core technologies. So, uh, a, you know, a search algorithm, uh, Sergey and Larry could do in, in their garage, right? Zuckerberg could, could build the initial, you know, core of Facebook in his dorm room. Uh, you didn't require laboratories and access to university research to, to be able to do that. So I think that's really the, the, the key decision point is are you going to need access to university resources or can you do it alone? And in today's world, I think a lot of companies and a lot of ideas are going more down the path of we can, we can do this alone, we can get the right people, and we, we don't need, especially if it's a software-based right. uh, company, we don't necessarily need full access to university resources. Yeah, I think there's nothing harder than trying to be an entrepreneur with someone else's idea. Yeah. You know, because it just takes so much passion. It's you know, such a roller coaster ride. And then to, to say, I'm going to predicate you know, my life to building this enterprise based on a technology that came from a guy I haven't met yet. Right. Um, you know, that said, we need entrepreneurs, right? We, we need people who want to do that to say, hey, here's a cancer drug. Because like you said, you can't really do cancer research out of your garage. Right. Um, at the same time, if I were an entrepreneur, I would try to avoid right, having to be beholden to someone else's idea and those, those encumbrances if I believed I had something that I was passionate about that didn't require that. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's an interesting, when you talk about even students, Student entrepreneurship. Offhand, I'd say 90% of our student entrepreneurship has nothing to do with the university other than that they happen to be students here. They're not taking our patents, they're not using our facilities, other than the facilities that are open use, but they're not using you know, our lasers or our animal vivarium. Um, and, and we love it when they do, right? Because that's the perfect world of, of someone tanning it, but it's very difficult mm -hmm. to do. I mean, Alexis, I don't know if you want to comment on, you made, you made a comment that a lot of the um, good companies you're seeing in the pipeline, in the startup pipeline in Greece are coming from universities. Are you seeing that, um, that tension between sort of students wanting to kind of do things on their own without universities or kind of going through the university channels um, with their companies? I think there's an, an, an element of institu in, institutionalization. If you have moved up the ladder as a senior researcher, it's very difficult to get into the momentum of starting up. But we have a, a newer generation of researchers who identify that they can do a lot of stuff on their own, exactly as uh, it was mentioned before. And they are pushing uh, professors and, and schools to commercialize. And if they don't, they will do it themselves. Unfortunately, we also see some universities coming back and asking for um, let's say patent ownership or, or business ownership. And it is sad to see that the university goes into a trial with a former student that it actually never wanted to support. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, a double-sided coin. Right. He brings up a good point. The, the best, the, the confluence when it really works is when a student become and takes on the enterprise and it's based on a technology that he or she was in the lab with mm -hmm. you know so that they know it well they may know it better than anybody else in the world other than maybe the principal investigator um, so there's not that sort of transition gap but at the same time they're unencumbered and they're going to do this when they graduate from school um, you know that is really probably where when things work best it is to have that you know I was a student in so-and-so's lab and I took this technology out of the lab and ran it as a career mm -hmm. um, but, but to go there as a student where you've just coming in a priori with no context, right. it's very difficult to say, can I see what you're doing and could we create a company around it? Right. Um, we had a question in, in the discussion forums from Nick uh, Eric Turk Kerner. I should not have pronounced it. He's actually a student of mine here at Case Western Reserve. <laughs> yeah, he um, and he gets at, and Joe, maybe I'll pose it back to you and then get the panel to discuss it, this um, tension between, or not tension, where licensing um, a university, I mean, a lot of the traditional yeah. approach for universities has been around 
commercializing technologies and licensing it off versus supporting some of these researchers. And we, and we had, in addition to Dave and the MOOC, we had Charu Ramanathan yeah. from Cardio Insight, who was a researcher here, yeah. looked to commercialize her technology initially through license, mm -hmm. and that path didn't work. Right. And then ultimately, with the support Created of yeah. the university and some funds, maybe you can talk a little bit about that tension between oh, yeah. it's um, a horrible tension you know and I, I i stepped away again uh, i ran tech transfer for almost 10 years here and then two years ago became the innovation officer so i no longer have to to deal with the ugliness of that tension but it but it's very real um because you know i used to say when i ran tech transfer people said what's your, what's your bottom line what are you you know what success it depended on your constituent to the individual inventor or to the student possibly it was what have i done for his or her technology to help move it along either into a company or to a license Right, so they wanted to hear what are you doing for me, appropriately so. To the dean or chair, they wanted the portfolio effect of what are you doing to help me recruit and keep students and 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 uh, you know pr principal investigators or faculty. Are you keeping them happy, keeping them out of my office from complaining? And then at the provost president level, they wanted financial return. And it's like those things are always at times very different, right? If you're only looking for financial return, you're going to try to do licenses to big companies. You're not going to support the student startup, right? If you're only doing student startups, then you're, you know, you're not going to have the solvency issues where, where upper management saying, what are we paying you for? You know, this is very expensive to have all these patents. And it, it is, it's, it's a brutal tension on the offices, on the individuals. And then, you know, the fourth player really here is, is the inventor who it's his or her baby. Even if they don't own it, even if the institution by law owns it, it's theirs. And if you try to say to them, we're going to take your baby and instead of, you know, getting to deal with Lockheed Martin, we're going to let this 20 year year old student create a business plan and see if he or she can get angel capital. Sometimes they love it, but sometimes they say, no way, you know, this is, I've been working on this 12 years. I'm not going to entrust this to uh, a kid who's doing his first venture. So it's a very difficult, uh, the tension, you know, it exists. I don't know how to alleviate it, right? It's, it, it, but it's very difficult to navigate at times it works well, like you mentioned with Charu, but there are certainly for every success, there are probably nine other ones where it turned out very badly, at least under one of those individual lenses. Yeah. You either didn't make money or or you, you made the dean angry, or the inventor wasn't happy, or the student was told he or she couldn't partake in it. And uh, it, it's very difficult to find the win, 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 win. Great. Um, Leonce, if, if you can uh, hear me okay when I ask this question, you had mentioned before about some of the work that you're doing at your university to um, enable access to capital. And next week in the MOOC, we'll have a whole um, series of videos. Um, get ready, MOOC students. You have three videos this week to watch. We'll do something on seed accelerators, something on angel investors and access to venture capital. But I'm curious that university role of um, helping your student entrepreneurs or other people at the universities begin to find capital sources to fund their business. Can you talk about why why are you playing that role? Is that is that a natural place for a university to play? It's not, it's not a natural place, but when you're in a place like Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, one thing that's very tough for entrepreneurs is getting, getting, getting capital. And, and this is for basic business, but just imagine uh, innovative business, business in, in, in which almost, you know, almost nobody believes in. But these are businesses in which you have some very high potential value, and this is a kind of businesses that you know, normally uh, emerging countries or transition, transitioning economies, they want to they wanna get. So this is something we talk that uh, basically since we have having programs with kind of senior people and they, they're kind of smart. They can, they, can, um, they can read a business plan and understand the potential of that business plan even if that's risky. So we talk, we, we, we work with a couple of guys that are students that are back to, to schools and they want to they wanna understand how business at the global level it, uh, it works. And these people also, they kind of have uh, this, this willingness of helping the country and of helping, you know, innovative business, innovative business to grow, to emerge. And we, we, we thought that we have this opportunity to, 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 to put in place a platform where these people, they could identify very interesting business and provide the initial funding for this business. Great, thanks. How about, uh, Alexis, maybe your perspective in Greece, what, what role are you, is Alba or, um, folks like yourself that are sort of have these university entrepreneurship positions doing on connecting entrepreneurs and your networks to capital? 
Well, on, on a personal level, or let's say on a job description level, uh, our job is to be a super connector. You need to be on your toes, and every time someone comes up with something, you need to think uh, through your contact list and see where a partnership would work. I mean, that, that is um, uh, our mandate, I guess. On, on a school level, it is easier for us being a privately, or let's say a non-governmental university, to contact the companies that are part of the ALBA community and uh, present ideas and concepts. Many of the older family business owners or the children might want to invest in something new to increase their portfolio. But the state universities do face uh, both legal and uh, culture issues, cultural issues, to connect with the companies and with uh, uh, investors. Right. And Joe, maybe you can talk briefly about um, what Case has done in terms of bringing some of its own capital matched with government money to deploy in, in companies? Yeah, the, the best way to access capital, it's not the easiest way, but the best way is to put your own skin in a game, right? Because uh, institutional capital or even angels are going to say, well, if you really believe in this, why aren't you investing in this? Now, there may be many reasons, you know, both tax uh, restrictions, you know, we're a nonprofit as well as we just don't have that sort of cash available. But at the end of the day, um, when it works well, it's when we all are sort of part of that funding continuum. So to Michael's point, we've done a few things. We created a seed fund, the first one about 10 years ago, and now we're just in, a, in the process of establishing the second fund, if you will, in that seed fund, which is a small amount of money from the university and our, our primary affiliate hospital, University Hospitals Cleveland, which collectively will put in $3 million matched by a, a state, so a public investment of three million, and that six million dollars will be deployed as the first investment in emerging businesses. Um, there are also talks in the work for the first time to be to create an institutional fund, if you will, maybe a 40 to 50 million dollar fund that would invest in enterprises mostly from the region, but also potentially ones that have strategic fits within the region and would do follow on financing as well. So this would be for a return. A return would be given out to the partners. Um, and uh, the Cleveland Clinic, a large hospital system in Cleveland, has done that over the last few years. They created found Foundation Medical Partners. Again, I believe it. it is when you can do it, when you have the cash, it's the best way to really bridge to the capital communities. Without that, it's just a lot of networking, it's a lot of uh, deal flow showing, it's a lot of um, you know trying to rise above sort of the, everybody wants money from these groups, um, and trying to use institutional, I would say, you know, alumni networks uh, are very helpful, right? If you think you have a business that one of your students or your faculty has created, you don't have a fund that where you can put money Money in use networks you have to alums you know that are with institutional capital um, to help them find a way to get you know again some some exposure some time with that investment channel but it's difficult as everyone knows right and let me ask a follow-up it came from a student uh, in the chat room who was anonymous I don't maybe because it was a hard question I'll pose it to you Dave um, he says whether a university should play a role in funding a startup given um, the unfair advantage it would give that company and whether it might lead to otherwise weak companies being propped up by university funding. I mean, maybe in, in the line stream context, because you, you were sort of evaluating that technology, I mean, what, what's the important piece of validation for a company? Is it university some funding or is it something else? I think it would be important for an idea or uh, you know, a research topic or a team to have some outside validation of a core idea. And I think that's where um, some of the other anchor institutions in the area can provide some feedback on the viability of commercializing that core technology. And uh, for, for LineStream, for the better part of three or four years, uh, Dr. Gao and his students were engaged with many of the local industrial leaders, Parker Hannafin, Eaton Corporation, um, who are giving them active feedback on, on the core idea you know, how far it needs to be developed so they could uh, easily take it and run with it, implement it. 
Um, and uh, I, I think before universities should start writing checks, there needs to be some level of evaluation on the commercial viability. And ideally, a lot of that feedback would come from outside the university. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the latter part of that question is, is very important um, because, as you said, you, you need to, you want to fund, you know, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, you fund the things that deserve funding yep. and you don't waste money on those that don't. Yep. And whenever people say, it doesn't even have to be at the institutional or the anchor level, you'll even for a state of Ohio, right? Mm -hmm. People will say there's not enough venture or risk-based capital. And others will say, no, there's a right amount because, you know, the companies that, that sort of Darwinian deserve to get funded to do, but the call question is, you know, should we be funding more companies? Should we at some point be funding less? And how do you not make it charity or, you know, lowering the bar such that you're just funding things that don't don't have a market trajectory versus making sure that things that do can, you know, take advantage of time and, and, mm -hmm. and create scale. And, you know, there's no easy answer other than I love your point is show that this aligns to the market before you write the check. If, if you're, you know, the, the anchor institution and you believe in it, that's great. You believe in it. Find at least one other group that believes in it before you write that check. Because um, it's so much, uh, again, that's going back to the federal point. The federal government doesn't make you do that. When they do peer review funding, they don't say, let's go out to the commercial markets and see if they would like this. They just mm -hmm. say, oh, a bunch of PhDs in the, in the room for the weekend pick yeah. the best science. Yeah. And, and it's hard to do it in a silo. And I think that feedback loop, going back to one of the previous questions about you know, should a university license directly or should you put it in the hands of a 20-year-old who may not have built a company before? Well, that feedback loop will tell you how far along and how mature that technology is. Yeah. Is it ready for consumption you know, by a corporation? And if a corporation says, yes, we love it and we want to license it, well, there you go. You have your answer. If not, who better to run through walls uh, than a fearless 20-year-old? Yeah, because right. it's going to take a lot of cycles to get through that yeah. next Well, and to your point about process. Cleveland State, right? I'm, I'm guessing Cleveland State didn't write a check into LineStream, right? No, they did not. But they probably helped get to Parker Hannafin and others because of they their did. strong they ties. Yeah, so. so there's more than just money yep. that they can provide. Mm -hmm. yep. And let me, let me get our international panelists involved in the conversation as well. And one of the key themes that we've talked about in the MOOC in week two, we talked about the role of donors. And donors could be... Um, foundations, donors could be governments in the case of Greece as a number of, um, of EU or other programs. Alexis, maybe you can comment first on kind of this, um, this validation. I mean, how many of the donor or government programs that are being used to fund entrepreneurs in Greece, whether they're coming out of universities or not, do they have that, um, that third party private sector match that's sort of keeping them honest? Um, to make sure that their their dollars or um, euros are going into the right to the right companies. Well, uh, they do, but not to the extent uh, like you might have it for one for one. We do have we do see donors. We just um, witnessed a, a wealthy Greek American offering half a million uh, dollars if they are matched by other donors. Mm. But in terms of European Union funds, we have an 80-20 or a 90-10 uh, matching process. So they will get 80% of the funds from the European Investment Bank, and they need to find the rest of the 20%. But being venture capitals, uh, they should be able to find more. So uh, it, once again, it seems to be skewing the whole process, not pushing it towards the right direction. Okay. Thanks. And Leonce, any thoughts about um, sort of the capital, access to capital in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, government and donors, um, and their role? And are they, are they funding the right kind of deals? In, in our institution, um, we, we are a non-for-profit institution. Um, so it's been, it's, it's been set up by donors. And all the activities that we have around entrepreneurship is it's, it's funded by others, by, by philanthropy. What we have around capacity building for entrepreneurs, what we have around uh, having entrepreneurs to pitch the business, to refine the business, to see what's the right business model, and what's the right channel for them to sell the business and to see how they could improve the innovativeness of their business. All these activities that the business school is running for these entrepreneurs is funded by donors that are basically some of our alumni or some companies that are working with our business school. Regarding, regarding all everything the government is doing for, for, for entrepreneurship, basically for now, they, they, 
as 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 much as as, as no, there's no funds, but there have been a couple of crises that's been organized, and recently in January, it's been a kind of um, crisis for the ten, ten, ten top of, of entrepreneurs. Um, they, they they won this prize, and they kind of been followed on by. By, by the government to see how how the business is kind of developing, how and by the end of the year uh, they, they're expecting to see if the prototype is okay, if they've or, they've already generated the first the first sales and everything. But what I think is going to be more interesting is that since we are in kind of very risky and uh, very risk uh, very risky environment, is that they they kind of having some funds, some small funds for startup, so that it's co it's, it's going to lower the risk of of angel investors or, or any type of investors. So since the government money, uh, government would provide some money so that it encourages more entrepreneurs to launch in, in some businesses and to attract also to see whether the risk of some businesses in which they're interested, but they cannot invest because they think they're kind of too risky, uh, see if the government invests in this business and six months of, or one, one year later, if these businesses are kind of successful, it's going to attract more funds for from uh, angel or, or venture capital. Great. Well, good. Well, um, we are almost at the end of our discussion, but let me let me pose um, one additional question here that actually came in from um, Andrew Cizazon, actually right here from Cleveland. And he wants to know the role um, that maker spaces play at anchor institutions. And yeah. Joe, we have one here called Thinkbox. Mm -hmm. We, at the public library, there's a maker space. Yeah. What's, um, why are these important and how can they contribute to the support of entrepreneurs? I think they're important on two levels and, and I, I certainly like them both. One is that um, it's a place where a, you know, an aspiring innovator, entrepreneur can, can start to you know, create nowadays, they call it the boundary object, but, but a prototype some, in some cases a functional prototype, but usually a non-functional prototype. But to start to give them some reduction of uh, risk, even if it's just risk of perception of what am I really trying to do here. So, the, so that quite simply, they're just a great asset for an innovator. But two, what I really like is they become magnets for networks, right? That in reality, and you've touched on the word network, and then some of our, our um, international panelists have talked about the value of a network. And these maker spaces are places where, I, hey, I'm a tinker, and maybe a, a, an entrepreneur says, look, I'm not the tinker. I don't want to build the mousetrap, but I'd love to work with somebody who has cool ideas. You can start to aggregate um, communities around these. And that's where I really love them. Again, do I think that the thing you actually create, the first thing in there is going to necessarily have market trajectory? I don't know. But I love the fact that they become sort of a, a uh, again, a community resource and almost a place that celebrates innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's where, as you know, with your program and with what we're trying to do is we're trying to make Thinkbox be that sort of, you know, we always say it's a physical resource, but it's also a virtual resource. It's mm -hmm. just sort of a, the, uh, the banner for um, innovation. And, you know, it makes sense to make it, I, I used to call it the, um, the uh, you know, in the U.S. we'll have, we'll call the, the student centers, the, the, you know, student unions. It's kind of the student union for innovators. Mm -hmm. and and um, and so I, I like them personally. I think they're great. Right. Alexis, any uh, anything like that happening in Greece? Well, we do have, um, if if I understand it right, we do have co-working spaces coming up. But it's also ending as a process because real estate is rather cheap and they didn't find their position. But out of that, we have a, a combination of co-working spaces and incubators uh, developing. Uh, working closely with universities, but not part of the university, and this gives them the chance to be more creative and uh, more to the point. And we also have, um, for example, the initiative of the Dutch embassy here in Athens to to open up uh, the Orange Grove, which is a, a setup to help a young entrepreneurs network and. Up and get uh, space and support and and access to markets. So we do see things happening. I'm not sure what the, what works best for the Greek culture, though. Right. And Leonce, any any efforts, whether it's co-working spaces or some of these maker uh, maker spaces, any of that happening in Cote d'Ivoire? Yeah, there are some co-working spaces in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I'm in contact of, with two or three different uh, co-working spaces. And uh, basically, in some, it's something very, very nascent, very recent. Um, and, and last week, when we had this meetup uh, with some of the videos of the of the MOOC, 
one of the discussions we had was how, how could we try to benchmark how could we try to see what are the best incubators in the world and what are the practices so that we could have the same level of qualities um, uh, with these incubators here in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire? Because the thing is, from these incubators, we could have the best out coming out and having very, very uh, innovative business growing up in the country. One of the things uh, our center, our entrepreneurship center, is trying to do is providing the support to this to these different incubators and take her so that they could see what is being done best in the world and try to trying to to improve and to groom very very smart entrepreneurs great well good well with that it's been a really rich discussion i'm glad we were able to work out the technical uh challenges of getting leonce and alexis to join us um and really appreciate um both of you guys doing that and to our local panel dave and joe um who who our MOOC students had already seen in the MOOC. And it's really such a great global dialogue, I think, we're finding in the discussion forums and for these kind of sessions that the issues that we're all facing are pretty similar. Yeah. Um, and I think the exchange of ideas, again, whether it's in the discussion forums, whether it's in your personal learning assignments that you're submitting each week and that many of you are posting in, in the discussion forums, it's really a great exchange and um, look forward to continue to learn. Um, we'll be back with you on Monday um, at 9 a.m. Eastern time, and I know there's some time, I actually think the yeah. U.S. time changes this weekend, so please consult your <laughs> internet clocks about what time that is in your community. Um, we'll have a pretty rich um, international panel on the role of access to capital, as I mentioned. We'll have three videos this week um, on, again, they're, they're short, they're 12 minutes long each, but it's a little bit more work for the students um, to get through them. Um, and then, actually, Dave and I tonight are going to see the most important economic driver in Cleveland is not entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's the return of LeBron James. So tonight we are going to see LeBron's, the king is back. The return of the, the, return king. Of the king. Return of the king. Return of the king. The anchor. They're, they're playing Cleveland. the Knicks tonight. So uh, look for us on TV with our uh, faces painted and That's our right. LeBron shirts on. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> give you a full, we'll give you a full report next week. Go okay. uh, So again, thanks for everything you guys are doing in the class. And uh, we will see you next week. Have a great week.